Welcome back. This is our final lecture for the semester, so we're going to finish up modern English with a few highlights of linguistic features and also how English has become a global language. Um, so we'll start with just some things on things like phonology and morphology, syntax, and we'll just cover some of the highlights of things since we're using what is essentially modern English today. Uh, we'll see what sort of things have changed from that early modern period that we were still talking about into what brings us into today. So with phonology, um, if we think back and we were trying to rely only on written records, we probably would end up concluding that English phonology hasn't really changed since before this time period, since the early modern period, because of our fixed spelling. Um, the fixed spelling hides changes in our spoken language over time. It hides all of these dialectal differences. We've talked about how in some ways that's a pro because it allows us to have the same form of communication regardless of pronunciation, but it also hides a lot of the variation and differences that we see in language um, and in English especially. Um, the development of linguistics, however, helps us with this because linguistics is a field developed in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. It's helped heighten awareness of language change. It's given us a lot of tools to describe and record sounds. So historical linguistics and dialectology have been especially influential in being able to do this kind of work. Historical linguistics is some of the earlier um, linguistic work that was taking place and, you know, being um, English being the language that it is where many of these scholars were first coming from, it is much more documented for this history, which allows us to even have a class like this. But some of the important things that happened were the development of the phonetic alphabet, so creation of the IPA in the 19th century, and the, the ability to begin recording speech in the early 20th century has helped pr tremendously in documenting and preserving records of changes, in hearing how things are actually pronounced, and then that information as we were able to start collecting recorded data to see how things are pronounced, comparing that with texts and comparing that with things previously, finding all of these linguistic patterns have helped us to sort of recreate the pronunciations, recreate the spellings, recreate um, some of the things that we see from these previous time periods as well. In terms of the actual sounds in present day and modern English, um, most of the changes to the sound system are just allophones. There's not really any phonemic changes that take place. The most recent sound that we have um, to come into English is our glottal stop. This is found in many dialects in contemporary English, but we don't know of any dialects that have it as a separate phoneme. For most dialects, it's just an allophone of T, um, so you would find it in very specific environments um, in something like saying kitten instead of kitten, for instance. Um, and because such a large percentage of native English speakers today are literate, we have the vast majority of English speakers have the ability to read and write to some capacity. Spelling pronunciations have actually had a greater influence on present day English than things in previous time periods. So what used to happen is people knew how to pronounce things and then they would write it down based on how they spoke. But now that we have this sort of codified spelling system, some of that ends up affecting how we pronounce things. So it's kind of the reverse of how things have happened in the past. So most involve the reinsertion of lost sounds in certain words. So the H in forehead wasn't pronounced um, for a while, the P in clapboard, the T in often, which some people pronounce, but not everyone. Um, but you don't find this in all words, so it's not a consistent pattern. So in silhouette, there's still no pronunciation of the H. The In cupboard, there's still no pronunciation of the P. In soften, there's still no pronunciation of the T. So in some cases, <clears throat> for things that we might be more likely to see spelled than spoken, you might see some of the pronunciations in the changing as a result of interpreting those letters as being part of the pronunciation. Sometimes it's also due to common sound and spelling correspondences. So the reason that we um, say uh, schedule with a k sound um, is because of words like scheme and school that also have an sch spelling. So we're sort of using analogy and expectations of similarity to pronounce things the same. Um, whereas the British spelling of schedule, our pronunciation of schedule, is mostly because of influence of foreign words like schuss or schmaltz um, that use sch for that sh sound. And also remember, sch was a common spelling in the Middle English time period for that sh sound. So there's evidence that that would have been able to sort of carry on that way as well. Occasionally, this can end up taking over entire patterns. So in American English, the pronunciation of L in words like palm and calm and folk um, amongst many speakers, but not all, um, is something that could eventually spread into other words like talk and chalk, which currently don't pronounce those L's. But over time, we may see that end up broadening in its scope and starting to be pronounced in others. So if folk is sometimes has an L before a K, we might expect over time that that L in front of other words with a K might also end up being pronounced. <clears throat> 
our, our consonants in present day English um, was already established by the end of early modern English. So as we mentioned, there's no new phonemes in modern English from early modern, but there is the in introduction of the glottal stop as our newest sound, but it's only found in allophonic environments. So the most recent phonemic additions, the ng and the zh, um, are things that were happening by the end of early modern English. They continue to have a pretty low function load. We don't use them in as many places as most of our other sounds. So the zh especially, is something we typically only find in French borrowed words. Um, we don't see it in all that many words by itself. So it's not all that common to actually be used. And for some speakers, the mm sound, our velar nasal, is still not phonemic and still mostly just an allophone of N before velar sound. So for most American English speakers and most speakers of English in general, mm is an allophone of N before velar sounds. But for some speakers, that's the only time that you actually find it. There's a lot of variation that's found mostly in our letter T. We have many different ways of pronouncing our T sound, um, but some of these may be spreading to K as well. So there's some evidence that there's some additional changes happening. Um, so things like the voicing of T as a flap in American English. So betting and betting uh, versus betting and bedding or ladder, ladder instead of latter and ladder. Um, so turning both of those sounds into a flap um, using a glottal stop, especially before an N in American English. So something like kitten or mitten instead of kitten or mitten. Um, these are features that are found in um, American English more so than in other dialects. Um, and the voicing of K is starting to be seen in some minimal stress environments, but not very frequently. And we don't really see this where there's any stress. So locker and logger don't yet sound similar to each other um, because they're in stressed syllables uh, where they're pronounced. Um, the pre-consonantal R was lost in the 18th century in received pronunciation, so the Queen's English, as well as in Eastern and Southern U.S. varieties, um, so things like the Boston or New York dialect, New Orleans dialect. Um, many areas are now reintroducing this, and it kind of goes back and forth based on levels of prestige, another sort of facet of socio-cultural linguistics and the sort of socio-cultural environment of why people are pronouncing things in certain ways. So there's some fluctuation that we're seeing with some of these patterns that we started seeing in the early modern period. With vowels, there's lots of variety with vowels. Vowels vary more between variety of English than uh, consonants do. The consonants are relatively stable in most um, different varieties of English, but the vowels are vastly, vastly, vastly different from each variety. So if I give you an American English vowel chart, it's, it can apply to many dialects. And if you look at a standard American English vowel chart, most dialects will use a very similar um, vowel chart with some feature distinctions depending on where you're speaking and um, where you're, what your background is. But distinctions between major varieties of English are extremely complex. Um, any form of English would really need their own phonemic vowel chart because there's so many differences. So an American English vowel chart looks very, very different than a standard British English vowel chart, than regional English vowel charts um, from England. So any major variety of English is going to have their own vowel chart because the distinctions are just so much different from each other um, than when we're looking sort of historically. We saw a lot of variation, but the vowels were relatively similar. And even if they weren't, we didn't really have a way to sort of document that. So we sort of assumed that maybe they were more similar than they actually were. Whereas now that we can record, now that we can actually see all of these different varieties as they spread throughout the world, these vowels have changed tremendously in these different varieties. Almost universally, however, the one thing that seems to be true, regardless of which variety of English you speak, is that in unstressed vowels, we tend to reduce them to either schwa or an i sound. Um, and that's something that we see commonly regardless of the dialect that you speak. So there's some universals that still seem to be the case for English, but the vowels in general are just all over the place. So we can't even create a, just an English vowel chart. We would have to specify what kind of English we're looking at for that. For things like morphology, we are pretty much the same as what we already had in early modern English. The inflectional categories that survived have remained. Um, the categories of nouns are still the same, so there's only seven nouns that still have a mutated plural, so foot, feet, tooth, teeth, those kinds of things. There's only three N plurals that remain, brethren, children, oxen. So most of those old English features have just completely disappeared, and there's only a handful that, are, that have changed. Um, and the mutated plurals that have survived are mostly in words that are relatively common, so it's unlikely that those are going to suddenly fall by the wayside over time. As in early modern English, there are still a few unmarked plurals, typically with things like animals. Um, so sheep, deer, salmon are the same singular or plural. Some might have both options, so you sometimes hear fish or fishes, elk or elks. Um, so there's some that are starting to adopt the regular plural as well. 
And then occasionally we see some distinctions with loan words. So octopus, octopi is something that we see. But you also can find octopuses as a thing. So as things become more common after they're borrowed, they tend to adopt this S plural. Um, adjectives have are just like early modern English, only inflecting for comparative and superlative. In present day English, um, we would use more and most um, for these comparison and grammatical markers. They don't really have as much of an intensifying function um, like they used to. They're just used to give us comparative and superlative. Um, and the rules for using inflection versus analytical forms are now based more on syllables than anything. So in, in monosyllabic words, big versus bigger, but we wouldn't really say more big. But in multisyllabic words, we would say wonderful and more wonderful, but not wonderfuler. So we've sort of even created a rigid distinction of where we use one versus where we use the other, when there was more flexibility in that in early modern English. For the pronouns, there's still some some um, robust pronoun distinctions in present day English. They still preserve some distinctions that are lost in all other forms. So we still have two numbers, singular and plural. There's still some case distinctions in pronouns as well. So we have subject pronouns and object pronouns and possessive pronouns, which is sort of left over from that genitive case. And so there's actually still some case distinctions in pronouns in English that we don't find anymore in any other word classes. Um, our demonstrative pronouns still have a singular and plural form, and everything else has pretty much lost all inflections, um, and the distribution and use of them has changed slightly. So we now use you instead of thou, for instance, and so some of the pronouns have continued to change since early modern English. Um, and we still see some changes with things like singular they becoming more widely used as well. So there are still some flexibility with pronouns and the changes of pronouns being used, um, but uh, largely the system itself has kept mostly intact. Verbs have also only kept a few of their inflections that remain, so our third person singular, our past tense, our past participle, um, our uh, present uh, progressive, that is what that should say. Um, we kind of have subjunctive, but it doesn't have any distinctive forms. These are phrasal forms rather than inflectional forms. So there is a present sub subjunctive that's identical to our infinitive, so that he be. We have a past subjunctive that's identical to our past plural, so if he were, um, or if I were. Um, for instance, would be a subjunctive use. Um, and then there's a steady change of these strong verbs continuing to weaken. So we don't really have a distinction in strong and weak verbs. We just call those verbs um, the sort of um, ones that are irregular verbs because they don't follow the same pattern as we would expect. And these are typically just a few uh, remaining words like sing, sang, sung, for instance, whereas others are just the word in the infinitive form and then an ed ending. And then our modals haven't changed, but we can't use them anymore without a following infinitive. So one difference that has changed is that we put our tense information on the modal itself, if it's a helping verb, in front of a main verb. And then in those cases, the main verb is just in its infinitive form and not uh, otherwise infected. Some of the other word classes we have prepositions. The biggest change is that we just keep getting more and more prepositions. These are increasing over time. And the usage increase has also led to multiple meanings. Um, so go to a friend's house versus go by a friend's house means different things to most of us. Um, there's distinct meanings that can differ by dialect now in prepositions. So in, at, and on um, have a different distribution in American English than they do in British English. So if you've ever wondered why that 80s song um, where they're in the middle of the house in the middle of my street, um, it means that it's in the middle of the block, so it's not actually physically in the middle of the street like American English would sort of dictate. So it's some differences in usage by dialect. And then conjunctions are mostly not changing very much. So most of our common uh, conjunctions are mostly stable and still around from Old English. So some of the ones that they used to have in Old English we don't really see as often anymore, but things like and, but, and or all go back to Old English and are still used in relatively the same way. For syntax, most of our syntactic patterns had already been established. We don't see a lot of big changes, and most of these are very minor, and they're more quantitative rather than big qualitative changes. So things like noun phrases, most of this has not changed. The only in change is that we've increased our noun adjunct phrases, so we can combine different nouns together, cell tower, lifetime ambition, etc., etc. Um, our verb phrases have changed, and they've changed by becoming more and more complex. So we're continuing an increase in complexity over time with our verb phrases. We have more tense and aspect combinations that are solidified in usage than what we had in early modern English. And we've even separated progressive from other 
uh, present tense um, by requiring progressive for ongoing situations. So she reads German versus she is reading German mean two completely different things and you have to use one or the other and they, they can't be used interchangeably like they would have been in early modern English. As far as clauses, we've lost a lot of the varied forms. So subject, verb, object is even more rigid than it ever has before. We don't allow things like verb, subject, object after something that was non, uh, non-negative. So in Shakespeare, therefore was I created with the stubborn outside. I would have to put I was created if I was doing that in present day. It is required, however, if there is a negative adverbial. So seldom does he smile rather than seldom he smiles. Or we just reword it to fit our SVO and just say he seldom smiles. So we can just completely reword it, um, but with a negative, we would have to have the verb first still. And then subject object verb is no longer allowed when an object is a pronoun. This was something that was still very common in early modern English. So a quote, as the law should them direct. Now we would have to put the pronoun the end and keep that SVO and say as the law should direct them. In terms of our lexicon, we're continuing to increase in lexicon over and over and over again. We're just adding and adding words, and we continue to do so. And so measuring this growth precisely is impossible, but in sheer number of words, our present day period, our modern English, has acquired more lexical items than in all of the preceding um, history. And this is something that seems to be true every single time, right? So Middle English had more words than Old English, and that was the biggest increase. Early modern had a sheer number of increased words and increased borrowed words, and then it continues where in sheer number, again, the most has been in present day English. Differences are present in the kinds of borrowed words also during these times. So in Middle English, the borrowings were largely French because of the influence of the Norman conquest, and it was across different areas of semantics. In early modern, these were borrows as well, but mostly from Latin. These were mostly learned and formalized words that have become more general over time. And in present day English, it's also still largely Greek and Latin in uh, nature. And these are typically scientific and technical terms. But we have seen all areas of life with an influx of words. So electronic technology has affected it, entertainment industry, politics, appropriation of foreign words, borrowing of foreign words as we encounter things. And we just creatively create new words as well. So things like fantabulous or discombobulation or bling even is just a word that's only been around for about three decades now. So we're just adding and adding and adding words continuously and that's just going to continue to happen. And then finally, think about English as a world language. This is an important thing about what English has become today, that it wasn't in the other stages of English, um, is that it has become a world uh, world language. Native English speakers are also relatively unique in their lack of proficiency in other languages. For most English speakers, um, you don't really begin studying other languages until high school, if you even have to do it in high school. Even at the university level, there's many states that don't require another language at all. In linguistics here, we do require other languages, but there's programs that don't require them. Um, When students do achieve fluency in these languages, a lot of them don't actually keep it um, because you lose that after your formal training if you're not still using the language after you're no, no longer in class and learning it. So a lot of us have sort of passive knowledge of some languages but aren't fluent any longer because we're not studying it actively any longer. Um, And most native speakers that um, live in countries where English is overwhelmingly spoken, it's the dominant language, and in most cases, it's the only prestigious language. So one big exception would be a language like Canada, where English and French are both official languages, but it still depends on where in Canada you are. So in the Western areas of Canada, French is official, but very few people actually speak it. They learn what they learn in school, but they typically just use English. Um, And when traveling, English is also widespread. It's become very common as a second language in many parts of the world. So it lowers the desire or need for many English speakers to feel like they have to learn another language in order to travel. And so that affects um, the sort of multilingualism of English speakers as a whole. English has become the most global language in the world today, so even more than what Latin used to be. Um, It's the first language of over 400 million people. It's the second language of as many as 1.4 billion people. And these dates are, these numbers are outdated now. These are probably much higher than that um, in uh, 2021. 
um, the official language of 53 different countries. It's also used in the United Nations. It's used in the European Union. It's used in NATO. So it's used throughout the world as either an official language or as a lingua franca or as a language that sort of unites multiple different countries and cultures together. And it's also the worldwide language of technology of things like international air. So regardless of what com country you're flying to or from, any pilot needs to be familiar with English because that's the only language they use in international airspace. It's the worldwide language of education and scholarship. So higher education is, almost, is frequently taught in English, even in other countries. Um, so English has become very, very widely used. And it's used in at least 80% of all information stored on computers around the world. This may have also changed a little bit since that number was first released. And some people are predicting that over time this may change as other languages gain traction. So there's been talk for many years about some other languages sort of increasing in their influence. So languages, the other most spoken languages in the world of Mandarin, Spanish, Hindi, and Arabic um, are likely to have a little bit more of an equal ranking um, by 2050, according to some estimates. Um, we're seeing an increase in the desire to learn some of these languages um, as they become more widely used, as they become more influential in other places um, than where they're in spoken. But the widespread use of English is something that's not accidental. This is something that didn't just kind of happen by happenstance. It didn't happen by chance. It's not also not because of any intrinsic linguistic superiority of English. English is not actually better than any other language. It's not better able to communicate than any other language, despite the fact that there's really strongly held ideologies about this by native speakers. A lot of English speakers think that English is a better language, but there is nothing better about English than any other language. English became a worldwide language because of the British Empire. So during colonization, during the early modern period, with the establishment of the British Empire, they would travel around and they would bring English as their language. They would force the colonists and anyone that they were colonizing to learn English. They would use English as their language of administration. It was the language of power in these situations when they would come in and take over different places. And so even as Britain's power started waning in the 20th century, America gained global status as a superpower instead. So English was still a power to be reckoned with because as Britain lost some of its power um, and sort of lost some of its colonies, America became this global superpower as, at the same time. And so English was still a worldwide language as a result of that. And so this leads to things like English language media being the most far reaching. Internet's rapid spread aids in the growth of English as well. So we see a lot of this um, being a result of technology, being a result of globalization, being a result of colonization, um, and sort of taking over other cultures and other languages and forcing English upon people. So it wasn't an accident that English became the world language it was, um, and it is now widely spoken as a result of all of these factors. And if we look at English around the world, you can see that there's some, so the darker gray areas are countries where English is the first and often the only language of most people. So places like Australia, places like the United States, places like England um, are the prime examples of that. But you see a lot of light gray shaded areas where English is a native language, as well as at least one other significant language. So places like Canada, most of uh, Latin America, places like New Zealand, which also has Maori, um, places like Ireland, which also has Irish. Um, and then you see a lot of places in these formerly colonized areas. So places in the Pacific, places like India um, and related countries, places throughout Africa, where English may be spread as a second language, or it's just not a native language, but it's an official language. Many countries have it as an official language, even though it's not widely spoken in those countries any longer and really never was widely spoken. It was just the, the language of colonizers. So to summarize everything for this modern English time period, phonologically, we've had a pretty stable sound system. We haven't really added or lost things among our phonemes. There's been a few minor changes in the distribution of the existing ones, and that'll continue. Morphologically, we haven't had any major systemic changes either, but there have been some category changes um, and some things that have sort of continued to lose ground and we're losing some of the inflectional things and using phrasal components instead. Syntactically, most of it's remained the same from early modern English. Some verb phrases have continued to become more complex. Lexically, we're vastly expanding our lexicon. We're adding words constantly. Our scientific and technical words are coming from mostly Greco-Latin roots. And then culturally, English is now as close to a world language as any language has ever been throughout history. It's more of a world language than even Latin was when that was risen um, and had the highest power through the church and through um, different empires. So English has become truly a world language unlike any other.
So that's all of the new information for class. That's the last of our lectures for this semester. I hope that you've gained a lot out of this, um, and I hope that we can talk about anything that you've gained in class together. Again, you can always email me, schedule office hours, and we can talk about these things in class.